Hello and welcome to the BRICS Academic Forum, where we have been discussing a range of issues on which BRICS countries can collaborate. Today, we are discussing sustainable lifestyles and rethinking consumption, the forgotten SDG. And the question is, can we afford to forget this SDG? We live in times that have been called post-normal, and all of us will agree that with the pandemic and the recent big events of climate disasters that we have seen, uh, the heat wave of Northern America, the floods of Europe, and of course, among BRICS countries, many events of climate disasters, we have been witnessing shocks to the systems that have been sustaining us of health and food and climate and trade. And we have seen how each is interconnected. We need to build sustainable and resilient systems. For BRICS, this is a topic of huge interest. The BRICS countries have much at stake when it comes to climate change. They represent the largest hubs for both production and consumption in the world and have shown global leadership in developing sustainable economies. And that brings us to the inherent contradiction in the very term sustainable development as BRICS countries move up the developmental ladder, rapid organization and demand for goods and services is going to increase. How do we find a balance between socioeconomic growth and environmental considerations? How can BRICS countries come together to find solutions to formulate policy on sustainability and consumption and align them with the SDGs? We have a really interesting and diverse panel to discuss these issues today. Professor Leonard Grigoriev, Principal Advisor to the Head Analytical Center under the Government of the Russian Federation and professor at the Higher School of Economics, Russia. He has worked on many aspects of the world economy on global energy and on climate issues. Shalu Agaral is the Senior Program Lead, Council on Energy, Environment and Water, India. She has worked on the changing energy landscape and on universal access to sustainable energy. Professor E. Wenjing is uh, the research assistant at the Energy Research Institute of National Development and Reform Commission in China. Her research is on energy efficiency improvement and on low carbon development. And we also have um, from South Africa, Professor Tokuzani Similane, who is the director of research at the Africa Institute of South Africa, which is housed within the Human Sciences Research Council. His research topics include bio diversity and environmental management. Thank you very much for uh, joining us at the BRICS Academic Forum. We are really looking forward to hearing your perspectives. I'm going to dive straight in by asking each of you to share your thoughts on this one question. The dominant discourse around sustainability in developing countries has been about the greater responsibility of developed countries. And yet we all have to do our bit as we know. So how do we balance the need for economic growth and development? which is essential for BRICS countries with responsible consumption and production. Uh, I would like to begin by asking Professor Grigoriev to share his perspective. Uh, thank you. I understand five minutes introduction. Um, thank you very much. It's a very interesting uh, topic and we uh, keep going with some uh, grants in the research in the university with my students. We're following what is happening during these two years. Out of a sudden, uh, the COVID drama, I would say tragedy, changed the consumption. Uh, reduction of uh, fossil fuel consumption in 2020 and a reduction of certain type of consumption. But as I said yesterday at the Economic Forum, it was concentrated in the consumption of services by rich people in, developed, in the developed countries. And it by chain, uh, it affected negatively supply of labor uh, and employment and incomes as poor in the developed countries and poor around the world in developing countries. So out of a sudden, COVID uh, made consumption a bit more sustainable, a bit more ecological, because rich people were locked, locked in the houses instead of traveling by planes or eating too much. So m maybe a bit less obesity. Uh, but obesity on fuels coming back. Uh, as, as you know, United States experiencing the uh, housing boom and uh, car uh, purchase boom. They buy buying now, um, and it, that's not electrical cars. They are buying cars 
uh, this, this, this time of the year. So it, uh, to some extent, to some extent, world is returning back as soon as uh, lockdowns are re re reducing back to the previous consumption. And maybe we could use uh, some lifestyle of 2020 as an example to figure out what is basically necessary for even for rich people to live, to how they could, could live without excesses of um, fuel consumption and maybe something else. Uh, that's uh, first. Uh, Russia is uh, experiencing um, rather difficult times uh, these two years, but we have um, now very uh, manufacturing recovery. And because of the specific of climate and territory, we are balancing our uh, our lifestyle a little bit better than before. Except right now, it's very hot in Moscow. <laughs> I would say it's, it's un un unusual uh, for this time of the year. It's very hot. Uh, still, uh, we must think what is going ahead. And uh, probably we should pay more attention to changes of the uh, healthcare systems and the um, structure of uh, we suggested even some time of maybe uh, taxation in a way to move money from excessive uh, fuel consumption or lifestyle uh, lifestyle uh, to the more specific needs of poor strata inside developed countries or uh, immediately outside. So we, it's um, we, there is a group of 15 gurus in the United Nations which are. Uh, is working on it. We have two years for modernization of CDG. And here is my friend and co-author, Sergei Bobolev, who is included in this group. So we probably need to think about consumption as a part of the recovery, as a part of green recovery. Uh, but the only green uh, uh, locomotive is not uh, enough. You cannot make it that simple. Uh, you need to do a bit more complex and more on the global level, or at least, at least on the BRICS level. We probably could do something better than just re returning back to the pre-crisis level. That's it. Thank you so much uh, for that. Uh, I'd like to bring in uh, Professor Wenjing at this point uh, to ask her to share her point of view. Uh, OK, thank you. And uh, it's my honor to be participated in this uh, workshop. And uh, Suyana mentioned that today's topic is about economic development of the developing countries uh, without deteriorating the environmental quality. Well, to me, since I'm from the Energy Research Institute, I think this topic equals to three E questions, which is economic, environment, and also energy, because the use of energy um, will produce some uh, pollutants and also CO2 emissions, which is uh, greatly correlated to with uh, the climate change issues. Uh, as for China, I think China has done a lot in the field of uh, energy efficiency improvement and also reducing the CO2 emissions. Uh, according to China's NDC's National Determinated uh, uh, Contributions, uh, China has made a commitment of reducing the CO2 intensity, which is CO2 emissions per unit GDP, uh, by 40 to 45 percent by the year 2020 compared with the 2005 levels. But actually, in the year 2018, um, the CO2 emissions per unit GDP has reduced by 46 percent already. So, which is uh, two years ahead of the uh, the time target. And also, the share of non-renewables has reached 14.3%, has to be reached 14.3% uh, according to the target, which is China also has already realized this target. Uh, for me, I'm, I'm doing research in the demand side uh, from the energy efficiency side, which is from the transportation, buildings, and industry. So today's topic is about consumption, so I would 
think the building sector and also the transportation sector is uh, largely correlated with, with today's topic. So I would like to share uh, the experiences and uh, what China has done in the building and transportation sector. And for the transportation sector, uh, China has designated a large amount of a subsidy for the retrofit of the old buildings, which is less energy efficient, and also doing some pilot projects for the zero, uh, zero carbon emission buildings, uh, which has some passive house technologies and also renewable technologies uh, integrated with the buildings. And also in the in the building sector to improve the electrification rates of the home appliances. And so the still the CO2 emissions of the building sector is still on the rise trajectory, but the growth rate is uh, slowing down uh, nowadays for China. And for the transportation sector, uh, China has put a lot of endeavors in the electric vehicle deployment. Uh, the ownership of the electric vehicles totaled 5 million uh, in the year 2020, which tops the world uh, largest, the biggest. Uh, well, in the future, the electric vehicles is not good for CO2 emission reductions in the transportation sector, but in the future it also can work as a storage source for the whole uh, electricity grade, uh, especially with the rise of the total electric vehicle ownership in the future. Another good example for the transportation sector in China is there is the shared mobility uh, business, new business models. We can uh, see uh, about 20 or 30 years ago, uh, Chinese people always uh, ride bicycles to work or to do some chores. But nowadays with the development of private uh, cars and private vehicles, less and less people are using, are riding bicycles uh, for transportation. But with the emerging of shared shared mobility and shared bicycle modes, uh, it's, it's very efficient, very convenient uh, to ride a bike, uh, to find a bike on the road, on the roadside. And uh, you can put it everywhere if it is not uh, uh, blocking the, the road and it's quite efficient and uh, it's quite energy saving and uh, CO2 emission reduction uh, friendly. So I use a shared bike every day. I think it is quite convenient and efficient. And some of the shared mobility uh, companies from China are also uh, spreading this business mode to other countries in the world, like the South, uh, the South Latin America and also some EU countries. Well, maybe that's uh, what I want to talk uh, about the experiences of China of energy savings and so so to emission reductions in the building and uh, transportation sector. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, those were some really fascinating examples that you shared uh, with us. Um, and uh, it brings us uh, now to uh, Professor Similani. Um, and, and of course, we also heard from Professor Grigoriev about how COVID has uh, brought us to this moment where consumption patterns have, uh, have changed. Uh, will some of those stay? Perhaps that's a point of reflection we can come back to. Uh, but in South Africa, um, uh, what what is the approach towards sustainability versus economic growth, and does it have to be a versus question, or um, how how can the two be reconciled? Thank you, Program Chair. The proposition which South Africa would like to put forward for consideration by BRICS nation under the theme of discussion today is the need to create a balance between the sustainable consumption, lifestyles and sustainable development in the context of how the BRICS nations need to transition from the fossil fuel based 
sources of energy to renewable energy. These come from an observation that since 2009, BRICS nations has expressed their desire to embrace the renewable energies as a socio-technical approach to sustainable development with an intention, of course, to improve the lifestyles and the consumption of its citizens. The first point for consideration, however, derives from a report that was co-authored by Mido and other co-authors in 1972. That report was commissioned by the Club of, uh, the Club of Rome and it was entitled Limits to Growth. This means that, or drew to the attention of the world, the fact that when you refer to growth and consumption, it has some limitations. In this report, the authors drew to the attention of the world the importance of population, where they said that if population grows exponentially, it of course increases demand for limited resources. So the emphasis on the regulation or the control of the populations was then popularized or gain attention. Agricultural production, which needs to be developed to ensure food security for populations and natural resources, bearing in mind that their occurrence are limited and they are largely determined by natural processes. Therefore, they require conservation and management. Industrial production, whose development ensure the supply of basic needs for populations and pollution, just as you indicated, Madam Chair, uh, in your opening remarks, that the world is witnessing a series of environmental changes that are reflected to the shocks and the disasters that we are experiencing in our days. Therefore, from the South African perspectives, or rather what South Africa would like to draw to the attention of the BRICS nations is that all the elements that have been highlighted, I have highlighted, are of course central to the BRICS aspiration for balanced and sustainable development within the framework of sustainable development goals. So the interaction to each and every of these elements, they present a dynamic system which the BRICS nations need to monitor, interpret, and act on it in a decisive way. So the centrality of energy in sustainable lifestyles, consumptions, and industrialization cannot be overemphasized. Therefore, South Africa's a, a, a preposition is that the migration to renewable from the fossil fuel based uh, sources of energy to, to renewable uh, energies with an intention to maintain and sustain the consumption levels that the BRICS countries are experiencing and the lifestyles of each citizen is that the impact of fossil fuel based industries and associate development uh, can be said that the fossil fuel sources of energy has had a significant impact in human lifestyle. Here we derive from SASO, which is one of the international recognized companies in the world that are based in one of the provinces of Mpumalanga here in South Africa, that of course is accused of uh, environmental uh, pollution. Hence, if you look at the, the industrial ecosystem that is linked to these industries, it supports a number of jobs for people, as well as also has created an industrial ecosystem which now is being exported internationally. Therefore, we can say at present assessment, the impact of fossil fuels on human development and associated lifestyles are illustrated in the chemical and energy industries whose existence is supported by the exploitation of fossil fuels such as coal and hydrocarbons. Therefore, the transitioning from the fossil fuel sources of energy cannot be abrupt, but it needs to be done in a smooth way. Moving forward, in terms of uh, now emphasizing the importance of renewable energies and how BRICS countries can embrace the renewable energy, I can say 
or from the South African perspective, we can say that the era of renewable energy industries, as it is intensifying, renewable energies are purported to have the ability to double the economic impact of fossil fuel based industries. It's an assumption. This derived from the observations that renewable energy encompasses a heterogeneous set of social technical system, meaning that the development of this sector shall include a wide spectrum of interrelated cha changes in the energy industries. This can be fairly distributed within the BRICS countries to strengthen renewable energy based industrial value chain. As an ecosystem of renewable energy production intensifies with the environment or interfaces with the environment via carbon emission reduction, the embracement of the renewable energy by BRICS will certainly put BRICS countries in an environmental path of protecting the environmental health and the ecosystem. So the state of environment health has a direct contribution to people's welfare, which in turn influence their health as well as the lifestyle. You've highlighted a lot of important points and we'd really like to get back to it. We're a little out of time um, and I would like to um, to invite um, Shalu next. Uh, so Professor Similani raised um, a lot of points about resource efficiency and energy efficiency, which is an approach that India has also taken when it comes to sustainability. It's something that you have worked on uh, yourself, Shalu. But do you think that that, is, um, that has been overemphasized and should we be looking at sustainability in other ways as well? Um, what is your perspective? Right. Thank you so much, Sunena, for having me here. And it's definitely a very interesting conversation we are having. Um, let me uh, come to your sort of question in a little while. I mean, I mean, I would like to set the context in the larger framework of, uh, you know, the first question that you asked that how do we balance the need for growth and sustainable consumption, which then, of course, also leads to is efficiency the only strategy that, you know, countries like ours can leverage. Uh, and I think, I mean, uh, all of us who are present here and listening to this conversation, I mean, you know, developing countries are right now charting two, you know, transitions in parallel at the moment. The first one is how do they meet the developmental needs of their people and how do they do so in a climate sensitive manner and pursuing uh, these two goals, you know, at the same time is not often an easy task and, you know, I think India uh, is trying to resolve, you know, some of these tussles by looking at lever you know, leveraging innovative technologies uh, that can allow us to leapfrog while supporting the needs you know, of uh, local employment and growth, uh, economic growth, but also pursuing an integrated approach to building sustainable infrastructure you know, and allowing sustainable choices for consumers. And I think it is within this bracket that a lot of our efforts on energy efficiency also fall, right? So uh, coming close to, you know, uh, the sector where I, you know, spend mo my most time on, which is, you know, how can we enable, you know, people at large to access energy in affordable yet sustainable manner, because that's really, you know, at the heart of sustainable consumption. Um, and it's, it also happens to be, you know, another SDG and a major one, uh, you know, over the past uh, two decades, India has managed to, you know, pull out 700 million people and enable, uh, you know, access to electricity and a lot of cooking, clean cooking energy solution. Um, even, you know, with ongoing efforts, a lot of our, you know, consumption remains low because people are using electricity, say, for very basic needs like, you know, running lights, fans, or TV. Uh, it's natural to expect, you know, uh, when a large part of masses, which is deprived of very basic needs, uh, you know, sort of expands its uh, energy consumption in the coming decade. So, I mean, it's a very uh, tangible and real question for all of us. You know, how do you ensure that people can meet their needs yet in a sustainable manner? And efficiency, of course, forms one of the core strategies to fulfill that. India actually happens to be one of the first countries to formulate a cooling action plan because um, energy use for cooling is one of the key drivers of our, you know, energy demand growth. And the way we are trying to, you know, solve for this problem is by uh, looking at active as well as passive technologies, uh, you know, that can provide people access to cooling, uh, operationalize behavior change in the manner people approach adoption of technologies, but also, 
you know, preparing a responsive ecosystem such as, uh, you know, the kind of service technicians or the kind of, uh, you know, retail ecosystem we have in the country. And uh, as part of that, I mean, India also led the, you know, a very large scale deployment of super efficient uh, lights or LED bulbs over the past five years. And we've managed to completely transform, uh, you know, the lighting market through um, an approach called by, by aggregating demand and procuring these in the bulb and from literally, you know, no lights uh, in the market, no LED bulbs being used uh, in the country before 2015. We have, I mean, these have almost conquered the lighting segment in the country. And uh, the same we are hoping to sort of uh, replicate when it comes to fans or air conditioners and even, you know, building uh, efficient buildings uh, because 70% of our building stock is yet to be built. And this is what I meant by, you know, leveraging technology to leapfrog because there is really a lot of co-benefit to be held, um, you know, by not locking ourselves into the kind of technologies that a lot of, you know, developed uh, countries have used in the past, but we have at hand a lot, uh, a lot many right choices. And it's really about creating a conducive infrastructure such that consumers can make the right choice. Uh, because I think often uh, the focus of the discussion on sustainable consumption is on, um, you know, can, how can we make consumers aware? Uh, how can we incentivize to consume responsibly? But it's really about creating, uh, you know, the right kind of uh, economic structures and infrastructure, which is the prerogative of the policymakers and also, also the private sector that will really define, you know, what kind of choices that consumers will make at the end. And to, uh, you know, just sort of uh, close, uh, as a closing remark, I would say uh, we also need to actively discuss the kind of larger growth narrative that we, uh, you know, sort of have around us, not just, you know, at national level, but globally also. And, and people's uh, sort of choices are not just formed by what they, uh, you know, see in their physical neighborhood, but, uh, you know, are very, you know, constantly evolving based on the interactions on the social media. So it's not just about what we are doing nationally, but we really need to, you know, uh, come together as a collective to think about what kind of, you know, um, future we envision and what kind of consumption, uh, you know, could define what it means to have a good quality of life. Because otherwise everyone would be aspiring to the highest benchmark being set by, you know, the top few in the society. So uh, definitely efficiency would not be the only measure that can help us, you know, solve for the larger problem. It's, it's, a, it's of course, a more tangible one that we are all trying to do. But at the macro level, unless we are really discussing those, you know, uh, uncomfortable questions of uh, uh, what is a good, I mean, how do we define prosperity? We would keep having these conversations, I guess. Yeah, I'll end with that. Thank you so much. Um, you have uh, raised, uh, raised some really important points about asking the uncomfortable questions, also the role of, uh, of policy making, apart from uh, our, us questioning our own lifestyles and awareness. Uh, Professor Grigoriev, um, you had mentioned, uh, of course, about how this moment uh, of the pandemic uh, has, uh, has made us think a lot and also changed consumption patterns. Uh, of course, uh, you know, do you think that this moment of crisis can be an opportunity when it comes to achieving the SDG of sustainability? And if that was so, then how can we move towards it? Uh, well, it's very difficult uh, to say for the whole world, uh, but we can. Uh, it, it's a bit easy for me to uh, give it advice to developed countries saying, OK, you reduced consumption in 2020, stay with it. Uh, it's it's very hard to say to developing countries. You reduce consumption uh, below the level of sustainability for some poor people. So you need to go back to energy poverty issues, to fighting extreme poverty. So we have completely different situation uh, across the globe. Uh, that's um, I would say Antonio Gutierrez was pretty clear about it from the United Nations. I would st stay as a, a difference. By the way, for, just for your information, I will be publishing soon uh, across the year new work uh, on uh, success by the title Successful Unsustainable Industrialization, 1880-1913. So describing how we 
current developed world made the breakthrough uh, a century ago, a century and a half ago. That's very interesting. You, you will not believe it. Especially I have a big topic on India and relations uh, with uh, United Kingdom, not on India, more, more on the United Kingdom. Uh, but still, it's, it's a lot. Uh, so it's a very difficult world. Uh, no, but countries should be responsible and saying, OK, uh, we can live with that level of consumption of fossil fuel or some other goods. And we probably need to structure the current policies um, to the, uh, in the direction of sustainability. What I'm actually afraid that the joy of going out of lockdowns, what we see people immediately goes uh, to spend more and to go to uh, restore the uh, habits of going to entertainment uh, creation, that's fine. Uh, but probably road must create a bit more, I would say, um, le less expensive, less, uh, less, um, uh, less, uh, less spending on the recreation in terms of fuel and maybe some other um, uh, type of expenditures. Uh, trying to figure out how we could create a bit more a uh, global understanding of what is a good life, not minimum good life for poor, but kind of a reasonable life uh, uh, for uh, rich. Without uh, engaging rich strata into this some kind of maybe self limitation on spendings, we probably will not uh, solve the problem because I expect that rich countries, uh, as soon as we will be opening, we are immediately will spend so much, you will, you will be surprised. Like buying uh, right now, Americans buying cars, and uh, it's not Chinese electrical cars, it's not California, that's the whole United States. And as far as my students report to me, uh, we are buying everything what is moving, everything. Uh, um, Russia is a bit different because we have medium uh, climate. Uh, actually, if you look at the globe, a globe, Russia is in, not in the United States. Russia is is in Canada uh, geographically. So we have a modest climate. It's very hard for us to ride the bike. We have um, lines for bikes in Moscow, but basically, it's in the downtown. We are not in use much, even in summer. Uh, but especially in the rains or in winter. Uh, we need to live, uh, I'm perfectly fine with this climate, <laughs> but it's not exactly how we can save in winter. Uh, but we, uh, we can isolate, we can move to efficient cars. We have a lot of, uh, we made a, a huge breakthrough in recent uh, decades because we are a gas, natural gas country. We have big oil, big nuclear, and big gas. Very limited coal, uh, but we, have, we need to improve transportation, isolation, some other industries. We can do it, and um, we are preparing certain progress. So we will be moving in this direction, not because the uh, European Union is going to tax us. Uh, it will tax China in the United States as well. <laughs> we will need to see how it works. Uh, but basically, it's not the external stimulus. We are trying to move more modestly. And the, mm, I would say intellectuals, the more uh, you have uh, educated people, more educated services, more intellectual services should probably replace, uh, I would say, consumption of fuel. Maybe people can do uh, con uh, something intellectual instead of uh, spending on uh, fuel. Thank you. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. Um, in fact, uh, as you as you said, uh, the different countries will need different approaches. Uh, but perhaps we can also find common approaches between us, and that really is the agenda of this discussion. Professor Wenjing, do you have thoughts on how a grouping like BRICS can collaborate on sustainable consumption? Uh, what what could those points of collaboration be? Uh, well, I'm quite on board with uh, what Shallow just said. I, I think energy efficiency is quite important for developing countries, for all the BRICS countries. Um, 
that when I was、uh, doing some research projects with the IEA, they said energy efficiency is the first energy. They said it's、uh, above oil, above coal, and above、uh, natural gas is the first energy. So,、uh, exploring the energy saving potentials. Uh, for the industrial sector, for the transportation sector, and also especially for Russia, for the building sector, I think、um, there is a large energy saving potentials.、Uh, we, we, in China, we we call it the low hanging fruit.、Uh, I I think that's quite important、uh, for us to not only to combat、uh, with the climate change issues, but also improve. The energy productivity, which is energy consumption per unit GDP, so、uh, that's the same definition.、Uh, well, I think China in the past past like twenty years since the eleventh eleventh five year period is the constraint targets、uh, for reduction of <coughs> energy intensity, and、uh, I, I would say we've achieved a lot of.、Uh, Good experiences that、uh, we can share with the, the BRICS countries, and also I suppose India, Russia, and、uh, and also South Africa, and also Brazil has some other very effective and successful experiences improving energy efficiency.、Uh, I think a collaboration mechanism or collaboration in energy efficiency. A、uh, technology sharing platform would be very、uh, beneficial to improve the energy efficiency for all the BRICS countries. So, so that's my understanding. Thank you for sharing your thoughts, Professor Similani. I would actually like to ask you the same question on、uh, if we were to find an agenda for BRICS to collaborate on sustainability,、um, what what would that be on? Thank you, Program Chair. Firstly, what I would like、uh, the BRICS countries to appreciate among themselves is the fact that they have the pro、uh, production capabilities, which、uh, supplies a lot of services and products among themselves and to the world in general. These production capabilities are central to the lifestyles of the BRICS people. Within their nations, therefore, the BRICS countries needs to strengthen each other with regards to these important production capabilities, which determine the way in which BRICS nations consume product. They consume what they are able to produce in a larger extent. Coming to the issue of sustainability, with regards to energy. As a focal point, again, BRICS nations have a variety of capabilities in terms of、uh, producing and making use of the energy capabilities they have. Russia with nuclear, India with coal, and South Africa with coal, and China with coal. So the point of consideration then is that the BRICS nations. Do not necessarily need to jump into a bandwagon of renewable energies, because the energy resources they have sustain the industrial ecosystem that support the lifestyle of its nations. Therefore, the big the BRICS nations need to allow themselves to transition to renewable energies, and in doing so, they need to develop. Uh, the support of each other, so that this transitioning period is not abrupt and therefore does not have adverse effects on the consumption and the lifestyles of its citizens. Lastly, will be a recommendation again to sustain sustainability. That can BRICS countries within the sustainable development be the first one that appreciate and integrate. The recyclers who are actually not being supported by any government and are therefore not integrated into the economies, hence they play a very important role of recycling, bringing back what has been 
uh, rendered as useless, but they are capable of bringing it into the mainstream of the economy. Can BRICS formulate a policy and a system to assist these people? Because we have them in greater numbers in our countries, so that at least BRICS can demonstrate to the world that we are able to form these sustainable livelihoods and processes that shows to the world that we care for the environment. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the point that you raised, in fact, about uh, recycling is a question that I want to pose to Shalu as well. Um, as so much of sustainability is also often about shared values and cultures um, within communities. If we look at uh, if we look at India, it has been a part of our culture: frugal living, recycling, circular economy, so to speak. Uh, as we move towards uh, development, uh, how do you think we can retain some of those um, impulses? Uh, thanks, Sunana. Very provocative question, I would say. Um, traditionally, I agree. Uh, you know, as it's in our culture, you know, to be very conservative about the way you know we consume, be it you know food, clothes, or you know um, natural resources, or or anything. And uh, that's that's a sort of a tradition that you know many of us, and especially our generation, has definitely you know, being private to and, and we, we are practicing, but I also think a lot of it is changing, right? And a good part of our consumption is, you know, very conspicuous. It's it's driven by the, the you know, personal individual egos and, you know, it's become a matter of uh, social esteem, really. It's not necessarily linked to our needs. Of course, I mean, talking about those who can afford, uh, you know, that conspicuous consumption, not need-based and, um, you know, to be able to sustain the, those, you know, traditional ethos of living sustainably in alignment with the ecosystem and the nature, we really need to, you know, start questioning uh, this practice, which is prevalent across, you know, um, uh, you know, our society. I mean, I'm not saying it's a inherent tradition, but it's, it's it's increasing by the way we interact and see each other consuming. It's sort of a reinforcing behavior, right? Uh, so how do we, and, and raise this question that how do you make sustainability aspirational? It has been traditionally valued, but it, but that value is changing and it's being replaced by, you know, consumption, which demonstrate, you know, power and, you know, uh, how much wealth or how much social status you may have in any given society. And I'm sure others uh, from other countries will agree with me. And, and that really, uh, you know, making sustainability aspirational and, you know, would help us define, you know, as people's income rise, it will be difficult to, you know, expect them to just, you know, go by the traditional values because all of us are adopting new values every now and then. And I think um, uh, more importantly, you cannot just preach what you don't practice, I think. And as elites, uh, you know, globally as well as internationally speaking, they are the ones who are setting the benchmark for what others can aspire to in terms of quality of life. So the people who are, you know, uh, setting these discourse on national level, international level, are really they the ones who are also, you know, demonstrating the way they live their lives. Because, I mean, everyone will look up to them. So I, I think we can't have two different standards for sustainability for those who have, you know, can afford it or not afford it. And I think like, uh, uh, it's not just about how a country approaches, uh, you know, this issue. Collectively, I think, uh, you know, across nations, and because I earlier talked about how we are, you know, are now a global citizenry. It's not about what the kind of people that I interact with at home, but also what I see on my phone or internet, right? So unless we are all collectively and uh, individually demonstrating action at an individual level, at a national level. Uh, and also having these discussions more uh, often, you know, are we on the right track? Uh, that, that's really how we can, I think, you know, retain those traditional values and persist with them. Uh, otherwise, uh, we are definitely on a competition to consume more. Right. Thank you so much. And of course, um, the sites of consumption will be cities and, uh, and, and all BRICS countries uh, have been uh, rapidly urbanizing. Uh, this, this is a question that I would uh, first like to ask Professor uh, Wenjing, uh, since China leads the way in, uh, in urbanization. 
that uh, how can our cities be made uh, more sustainable, more resilient, and that question becomes uh, all the more urgent um, at the time at a time like this with the pandemic. Well, um, I I think well the China has uh, done a lot in fighting the pandemic. And uh, there's a lot of uh, restrictions and uh, not to do uh, policies uh, carried out by the government. Um, I think some of them are, are successful and some of them, are, I would say, not very uh, people friendly. And uh, sometimes it's kind of uh, foot restraining and things like that, but it's quite effective in fighting uh, the pandemic uh, in this regard. And this, the result is good. That is quite uh, beneficial for the economic recovery uh, at this moment. But I, I would say um, the policy may be a short term the restrictions of the policy maybe maybe may are short term uh, trade offs, but in the long run, we need uh, more sustainable or more smart policies in combating uh, the pandemic. Oh, another point I would say that uh, the digital, the big data uh, is quite helpful in tracing uh, like the the symptoms or the tracing the tracing back the, the, the things I, I, I think um, this kind of tech IT technology is, is quite helpful for China uh, for Actually, Chinese cities. My question was uh, was was less to do with uh, with the health uh, aspect of the pandemic and more with just sustainability and urbanization and how can we make our cities uh, more sustainable because uh, China takes the lead when it comes to urbanization out of the countries. Oh, okay, sorry. Uh, okay, uh, to this point, I would say um, China is not a very has not done very good uh, examples experiences because uh, since I live in Beijing, Beijing has twenty million people, and uh, I'm lucky. I just take about half an hour to work every day to commute, and some of the people has to spend. Uh, one hour and a half uh, for commute, and so so for for two times, like like two or three times on average to commute every day. So so that is the city's sprawl uh, is very serious for Chinese cities, especially for super cities like Beijing, Shanghai, and Shenzhen. So for China. And um, for some policies has proposed a balanced uh, city develop urbanization mode. Uh, so to control the size of bigger city uh, super cities and uh, to improve the infrastructure and, and to prove that the, the medium sized cities to attract more people to live there. So so that's the strategy. But uh, actually uh, in the real world, uh, the story is, is not is not like what we like to see. Um, I would say that um, Chinese policy would uh, try to do uh, a balanced urbanization mode or, or trend. Uh, so so that's the target, and more efforts needs to be done in in this perspective. Yeah. So okay. Um, thank you for that, uh, Professor Grigorov. Uh, I would like to ask you, um, well, if you would want to add anything to what uh, Professor Wenjing just uh, just talked about, uh, the question of urbanization and sustainability um, from the Russia perspective, uh, but also uh, in terms of uh, how um, Russian, uh, the federal government, uh, the sub governments, uh, is is sustainability uh, an issue that gets uh, that gets enough? Um, let's say importance is it something that that has uh, that is that's important in policy discourses well no, russian strategic policy organized by certain uh ukazi uh, decisions of the president so we have com uh, i made the combination if anybody wanted uh how cdg objectives goals 
and Russian projects, presidential projects could be matched. Uh, it's pretty easy. Uh, so basically it goes by big projects and uh, it includes a lot of things. And um, but Russia retained a lot, uh, a lot from the Soviet Union system, for example, of healthcare education. It helped a lot at this time of pandemic. So sustainability on the health side of what basically is thanks to the Soviet system, which wasn't um, de destroyed uh, by market approach and everything, op optimization and um, paid medicine. So we probably should look ahead in the sustainability by including CDG free healthcare, CDG 10 inequality into the uh, broad picture. And I have a um, uh, um, my article on this on this side. I don't think that green recovery is the only locomotive which may solve all the problems. We should um, take it a bit more broadly, looking into energy uh, poverty, healthcare, and so on, because we need sustainable life under uh, COVID um, pandemic, not just uh, saving of fuel. Yes. Yes, thank you for sharing that, uh, that we need a holistic approach to sustainability. Uh, we're running out of time, I'm afraid, and I would like to uh, to quickly bring in Professor Similani and then Shalu, we, you have one minute each uh, just to offer your concluding thoughts on this discussion. Thank you, Program Chair. From my side, I can say that um, uh, the COVID-19 has permanently transformed the lifestyles of people uh, in the urban setting in the sense that since now it's easy for people to work wherever they are and connect wherever they are, then there is a less dependency on transportation. This means that in the urban setup, there will be less congestion. The words like uh, the peak time where everybody is rushing to be on the road with the purpose of arriving earlier at home are going to change. This present bricks with an opportunity to further investigate and study the changes which BRICS is going to bring, I mean, the COVID-19 is going to bring in the lifestyles of the people. Whether COVID-19 somehow is going to benefit the environment in some, in one, in one, in one way or the other. I think that will be a very important message for BRICS to take forward. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, I think, um... Again, I concur with uh, you know what Ms. Basing and my previous speaker spoke. Uh, COVID, at least in the Indian context, COVID you know sort of demonstrated the lopsidedness of rural urban you know development that we have in many parts of the country, if not everywhere. Uh, we saw millions of people migrating, say, back to uh, their homes in rural areas during the lockdown, and also how reliant you know often our cities are on labor from the hinterland right and really i mean what that i mean exposes the need to pursue balanced regional development right you cannot just see cities at the centers of growth and as long as we are we have that we will keep you know worrying about urbanization leading to lock in of energy infrastructure and you know sustainability issues and so what we really need is to create uh, one safe inclusive spaces for you know people who are working in cities but also create opportunities for uh, growth and livelihoods in the hinterland right and i Again, I mean, uh, my organization, CEW, has been running a program it's called Powering Livelihoods to demonstrate and test out how, you know, renewable energy based uh, uh, livelihood applications such as, you know, food processing units or textiles, etc., could create livelihood opportunities in rural areas. And unless, you know, we start focusing on, uh, you know, the hinterlands as, as a center for growth and uh, opportunity for people, I mean, uh, I mean, that will be like really, I think, which will help us, you know, have sustainable consumption uh, as well as infrastructure. So thank you very much. Uh, we do seem to be at some sort of tipping point when it comes to uh, the topic for today's discussion. We are all uh, more sustainable now. Uh, but can we retain this spirit? Uh, thank you so much uh, to our panelists for uh, for sharing your perspective to Professor Vigerio. Um, to Professor Wenjing, to Professor Semilani and Shalu Agarwal. 
Uh, we look forward to having more of these discussions with you in the future. Thank you for joining us today.